you're a petroleum operator, you know the oil and gas industry is changing fast. You've got to adapt to the future by creating greater efficiency in operations, reducing risk, and designing for a more sustainable future. You also know everything in energy happens somewhere. And since getting location right is so important, turning to ESRI gives you the power you need to stay ahead. You get the most advanced capabilities in the industry from the world leader in location technology. With our integrated GIS platform and huge partner network, you have access to groundbreaking solutions and a complete GIS enterprise system. Network management tools with True3D let you visualize your system the way it looks in the real world and bring your design to life to model and manage emerging renewables. Spatial tools give you a better understanding of your network and assets. Mobile field apps streamline data collection, routing, and navigation. When natural disasters strike, you get real-time monitoring of operations to reduce risks, speed up recovery, and get back to business faster. And you can create a true digital twin of your network to show connections that match the real world. Plus, an open architecture lets you share maps and apps on any device, any system, anywhere, anytime. And with cutting edge spatial analytics, you can leverage IoT, artificial intelligence, and machine learning to understand the past better and forecast the future more accurately. With S Relocation Technology, you'll have everything you need to supercharge operational efficiency and diversify to meet growing demands of the future. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the final day and the renewable energy session of the Petroleum User Group 2021. My name is Billy Patel, and along with my colleague, Alessandra Millikan, we'd like to welcome you to today's renewable energy session. We are both pleased and honored to have you in attendance with us today. Renewable energy presentations have featured uh, as part of the PUG uh, over many, many years. As operators historically have expanded their portfolios to include wind and solar investments. That trend is clearly accelerating. We all watch the news, we all see what's going on in the industry. Uh, and this is now accelerating quickly to also include things like biofuels, geothermal, which we'll look at later on today, hydrogen and hydro as well. And it's a pleasure for us to see the numbers that are attending our dedicated renewable energy session today. Along those lines, I'd like to give recognition to the growing number of independent renewable energy operators, our partners, uh, educators and educational institutions, and public research agencies joining us virtually today. It's great to see this renewable energy community grow and take a life with its own. We'll talk more about that towards the end of this particular session and how we at ESRI can further support you as an independent renewable energy community. But for now, let's focus on today and specifically the next couple of hours or so for this particular session. Dal uh, showed this slide uh, in a slightly different form in the plenary, and it's a, it's a thread that has run through all of the presentations that we've had so far. The purpose of today is essentially to provide a forum where people can share and learn from each other. People can learn what other people have done, uh, and ultimately, it allows all of the members of the renewable energy community to learn more about the benefits of geospatial technology. Your reason for being here today, it could be that you are trying to create a vision or trying to create the strategies to be able to get there. You may be here to seek understanding uh, and find uh, guidance on some of the things that you aspire to be doing. You may be here to see how others have implemented technology that validate your own aspirations. All of these, of course, are valid and great reasons. And what we have found in many of the communities that we support is that this willingness to come together, share knowledge and experiences, it essentially strengthens us as a community as a whole. What this actually, and, uh, what this actually ends up doing is making us all get to where we want to get to helping us to achieve those goals in a much quicker, much more efficient, 
possibly even a safer way. Our part in this, and by that I mean Esri, is first of all to provide a forum like this for you to be able to exchange those ideas. And we're so pleased today to have a terrific agenda of varied talks. In reality, uh, we had way much more material that we can actually accommodate, but that's actually put us in a very uh, good position uh, where we need to think about how we actually have a longer renewable session at the pub. Maybe we have uh, more webinars around this and specifically wanting to get you involved because this is your community. We'd love to get your feedback on how we should do that. The talks today will focus on not just the business of renewable energy, but also how the use of technology is supporting certain workflows, how commercial off-the-shelf applications uh, are being implemented or being deployed. There's also opportunities to see how companies have developed their own solutions based on that software, ultimately to create business value. I'm sure you have all seen the agenda. Nevertheless, I'll hand over to my colleague Alessandra to, to recap. Yeah, thank you so much, Billy. And hello, everyone. Um, for anyone I haven't personally met, I'm Alessandra. And it is safe to say there's a really terrific mix of renewable energy operators and service partners who will share how they are applying geospatial technologies to wind, solar, and geothermal projects today. All of them really demonstrating innovation, the progress they've made, and the smart things they've done and are planning to do with geospatial technologies. So as per our agenda today, we will have some time after the presentations for a live Q&A with our fantastic speakers. So on your screen, just to the right of this live video, you should see a chat feature where you can actually submit your questions throughout our entire time today. And since we'll be covering a lot of ground in all things renewables, we do encourage you to post any questions as they occur to you during the presentations in that comment box. And also a little helpful tip, when typing in your question, it really helps us if you reference the specific section or presenter for your question, and we'll do our best to answer all the questions at the end of our session. So when you think about it, many of the implementation scenarios that we'll show today have a lot of great similarities to the oil and gas business, where to place a wind turbine or solar plant, how to engineer its construction and implementation, optimizing field maintenance and protecting, protecting field staff and assets from harm. They're also expanding adoptions of innovative technology development, like geothermal, which we'll look at today, that more and more oil and gas companies are exploring to harmonize their portfolios. So as you watch the various presentations today, we'd like you to think of these four themes which struck Billy and I as we reviewed the material in preparation for this meeting. Number one, growing investments. How quickly some companies are moving to diversify their portfolios and embrace renewables or pivot entirely in that direction. Acceleration, how swiftly renewable energy industry and all companies involved are rapidly growing and how all energy associated companies can gain an advantageous position in this relatively new sector. Next, diversity and opportunity. How much room there is for everyone to develop skills or specialisms in this rapidly growing arena. Some will undoubtedly focus on one area or another while others will hedge their bets. And of course, why we're all here in attendance today, the relevance of spatial technologies and experience. There's a tremendous familiarity in the workflows described in these renewable case study examples, and therefore spatial analysis is clearly imperative to their effective implementation. And again, at the end of our time, we'll come back to some of those in the Q&A uh, towards the end of the session. But with that, I'm going to hand it over to Billy to orient us to our first speaker. Thanks, Alessandra. Uh, as, as you've just seen on the agenda slide, we've got a full agenda of presentations. Uh, they're all broad in scope and detailed in content, and we're sure that you will benefit from each and every one of those. We'll hear about transition or a pivot. We'll see real world examples of how assets are planned for within the renewable energy sector. We'll discover how 
older processes are becoming more efficient or being made more efficient, we'll see how new processes are actually being developed. And all of these are increasing commerciality and value, like I mentioned before. We'll also consider analogies to the, the world of oil and gas uh, for obvious reasons. And of course, you're at an ESRI conference. So as Alessandra mentioned, this will all have an ESRI and a GIS location intelligence twist to it. So let's go to the first of our presenters. Uh, it's Anne Bride Proceda from Orsted. She's the GIS manager. And she'll talk to us about how a predominantly North Sea EMP company changed direction to become a fully fledged, profitable renewable energy company now with a global footprint. I'm sure we're all excited to hear about it. So Anne, over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, and uh, this is probably going to be a little bit of a less technical presentation than uh, the ones you've seen before. So um, I hope you can live with that. Um, so welcome to this presentation on uh, on Earthstill Offshore Wind um, and how GIS is used for developing, constructing and operating offshore wind farms. So my name is uh, Annabelle Posner and I'm the head of the GIS team which currently consists of 20 plus GIS specialists supporting all of our wind, farm, uh, wind farms globally. Um, from uh, from our currently our three offices in, uh, in Denmark, in the UK and in Taiwan. So who is Rastel? Um, well, we are the global leader in offshore wind. Um, and for the second year in a row, we've been ranked the number one um, most sustainable company in the world by the Corporate Knights Global 100 Sustainability Index. Uh, and actually just, I think it was last week, uh, we made the Times 100 most influential companies in the world. So we're very proud of that. Um, our vision is to create a world that runs on entirely on green energy. And our target is a farewell to CO2 and a 98 a percent reduction in emission by 2025, which will uh, make us carbon neutral in energy generation and operation. So I joined Erstel Offshore Wind uh, in 2010, which is now a little bit uh, more than a decade ago. Um, and at that point of time, there was no independent offshore wind division. Um, we had built less than 850 megawatts uh, of offshore wind um, and our market at that time was Northern Europe, which was also where our offices were located. And the company consisted of uh, three main div uh, divisions, so oil and gas, power plants and energy distribution, where oil and gas were the biggest part of the company. So today, we have completely said goodbye to oil and gas. We sold off all of our uh, oil and gas assets some years ago. Uh, and we are now a global company on a global market. We currently have about uh, 7.5 gigawatts in, in operation across the world um, and are building uh, currently uh, another 2.3 gigawatts uh, in two projects, so one in, in the UK and one in Taiwan. And the company today is built up by three major uh, areas. So we have offshore wind, we have onshore, and we have market and bioenergy. So that's really the main part of our businesses. So as the difference a lot from many of our competitors, as we both develop, construct, and, and operate offshore wind farms, um, and my team, the, the offshore wind uh, GIS team, we support throughout the lifetime of a wind farm, which actually also means that we have this cradle to grave view on data and, and development and really try to focus on that throughout all phases. So we actually start out uh, before development in the really early uh, pre-development phases where we uh, help um, assess new markets uh, and project opportunities. We support with uh, feasibility studies uh, and due diligence and really help uh, support some good business decisions on uh, which projects to go for. And at some point of time, we moved towards the developed phase. This is really where uh, we either have a project uh, 
or are uh, looking to bid for a, a potential project. Um, and here, uh, and I'm sure that if some of my team members uh, are on the call, they will probably laugh a little bit because I say this quite often, but we really sit as, as this spider in the middle of the spider web um, because we really support the entire project, working with all uh, the different teams that are involved in developing a wind farm. So, um, for instance, we work with uh, our permitting team, supporting environmental impact assessments, uh, doing visualizations for public consultations or um, any kind of reporting for uh, governments or uh, something similar. We also work with our geophysical and our geotechnical teams, preparing for surveys, uh, QAing data, incorporating data with project data. Um, and and then we also work with all of our technical teams. So pretty much all the components of the wind farm. So our foundations team, our cables team, um, our turbine teams and, and the onshore teams. Um, so really uh, gathering a lot of data uh, across the, uh, the development phase. And we also do uh, wind farm layouts, cable routing planning and site scoping. And then uh, the final thing is to, uh, which is actually one of the first things that we do in the development phase is to define some standards, some geospatial standards for each project. And this is really to ensure uh, that the data that we collect in the very early phases can also be used throughout the lifetime of the projects. So as we move into construction and preparation for construction, our uh, standards uh, and our standard documents are incorporated into all of our installation contracts. And this is really to ensure that the data that we get throughout uh, construction is to the, to the quality uh, and the standard that, that we require. And in these, uh, in these standard documents, we also define um, how we want to receive data, um, when we want to receive data, um, and then the geodetic standards. And during construction, we really have this day-to-day -day collaboration with the entire construction team, the back office, uh, and all the installation contractors. And this is really to ensure that uh, we have, uh, or the project has a joint view of the world, uh, so we can reduce any risks of accidents um, from people not knowing where everything is. And then finally, uh, we really need to ensure high accuracy of the as-built documentation that we take through to the operation phase. So at some point of time, we've finished building uh, and we're ready to operate our wind farm. And in this phase, which is uh, currently about 25 to 30 years, um, there is ongoing reporting to the authorities. Um, and of course, we use all the data that we've taken from construction uh, to uh, ensure asset integrity. So for instance, monitoring whether our ex uh, cables are uh, getting exposed or uh, we see uh, seabed development that we didn't expect uh, or things like that. Um, and again, we also support uh, all of our geophysical surveys um, and collect data if anything uh, needs updating uh, so we can continue to operate our wind farm. And then finally, we also enable uh, access uh, to all of our essential data uh, for all of our maintenance and repair work. So the main responsibilities of my team is really these four different categories. Um, so the first one is data management and visualization. So as you may have seen from the previous slide, we collect a lot of data and a lot of different data. Um, and uh, and and we, as I also said, we we try to uh, uh, set a data standard very early and then maintain this throughout uh, uh, a project lifetime, but also across all the projects. And then we do a lot of visualizations, uh, and visualizations should really be thought of in a broad term. So. Obviously, we do create a lot of maps for um, official um, documentation or for reports or similar. Um, but we also maintain uh, online viewers for internal and external use, uh, both in, in 2D and 3D. Um, 
And then um, we do a lot of geospatial analysis. This is really classic GIS. So everything from proximity analysis, constraint analysis, volume calculations, raster analysis, and much, much more, really depending on what's going on in the project at, at any given time. And then, as I said, we set the standards. Uh, and these standards really try to maintain across the projects. Uh, so it's the geospatial data, uh, for instance, the geodetic standards, uh, both the horizontal and the vertical standards. Um, and, and this is really also to ensure that, that all the teams that we work with uh, know um, what the project looks like uh, when they need to start developing uh, and constructing the wind farm. And then final, finally, we also uh, maintain a number of tools and digital products. Uh, so for instance, we use, um, we use field apps to allow uh, the projects to collect data in the field. Um, that could be anything from um, looking at an onshore cable route or uh, mapping out different items uh, and, and really communicating uh, across different teams. So um, just an example of, uh, of what a new market could look like for us or has looked like for, for us. So um, we've been in the US since uh, 2015, uh, where we bought our first project along with uh, Res America. And uh, ever since that, We've expanded our scope uh, by buying up a number of companies. Uh, so we now have uh, expanded into both storage, solar, uh, offshore wind, and also onshore wind. We also currently hold uh, power purchase agreements for five of our offshore projects. Um, and we have one project in operation, which is the Block Island uh, project that we uh, bought uh, with one of the companies we bought uh, some years ago. So what have we learned from going into a new market? Well, we the, the lack of industry standards have really become very clear. Uh, it's very visible uh, when you work in a new market with new contractors, new partners, new governments, um, that the amount of industry standards are very low. Uh, offshore wind is still a very young industry, and some industries would, uh, some sorry, some industry standards would really help to support the collaboration between contractors um, and governments. Then the, the other thing that we've learned is. Uh, working with consultants. We also work with consultants on other markets, for instance, the UK, um, but uh, consultants are very highly used in the US. Um, and a lot of them do not use GIS. Um, they primarily uh, work with CAT or Google Maps. And this makes it very, very difficult for us to uh, exchange data and also maintain a high level of precision on the data that we, we receive. And it also makes it very difficult for us to automate some of the processes where we were trying to exchange data uh, through services. Then uh, the next thing is access to data. We saw a really good presentation before uh, with, the, with the marine viewer. Uh, and one of the things that we've we do see uh, when we go into new markets that is that uh, getting any data can be really really difficult. But actually, in the U.S., it's been the the complete opposite. There's so much data available, uh, and a lot of uh, the different data sets overlap. Uh, so it's really really difficult to assess which one to use, which one is better than the other, um, and maybe you need a combination of different data sources. And then the final thing is units and geodesy. Uh, th this is probably a classic European company moving into uh, the US problem. Uh, but as I said uh, earlier, we really try to standardize across projects. Um, and it's really difficult uh, to develop projects in the US where uh, with a system that's built on a, on a metric system. Um, also, uh, when we work with uh, a lot of consultants. We've had to learn that uh, C-charts uh, 
uh, with depths are in feet and fathoms, which we are definitely not used to. So, uh, so we've had to uh, to move around that and and try to work with it. And then we still have some things to learn. Uh, we still uh, need to learn uh, more about governmental standards. Also because uh, the governments are learning and developing at the same time as we are. Uh, so it's kind of a moving target. And then we also still need to learn more about constructing a full scale project in the US. Um, we have uh, helped uh, build a small scale project called Virginia Coast. Um, but uh, really moving into a full scale, scale project uh, is a new thing. So uh, maybe stepping a back, uh, stepping a, a little bit back, uh, and looking at uh, where did we come from with our oil and gas uh, uh, division. So I have to admit this is a bit of speculation from my side uh, because uh, when we had an oil and gas division, we were really two separate teams, um, but we did collaborate across. Um, there are some similarities and some things where you can transfer your knowledge from uh, oil and gas uh, and to, uh, uh, into offshore wind. Um, and the first one is really the power of GIS. Um, this is really where a lot of our uh, GIS skills is transferable, um, mainly because in GIS, a dot is a dot. It doesn't really matter if the dot is an oil and gas rig or it's an, an offshore substation. That's additional information. Uh, but the geographical information, whether it's one or the other, doesn't really matter. And the same goes with lines. Offshore cables and pipelines, they really work in the same way. Then also oil and gas and, uh, and offshore wind works with a lot of the same data types. Uh, for instance, our geophysical and our geotechnical data. And, and we, uh, for instance, work with a modified uh, SSDM uh, data model uh, when we uh, standardize our survey data. And then there's a collaboration and integration. Uh, so many of the same types of teams are involved uh, and therefore also the same integrations with different uh, systems are also involved. And that was really it. Great, thank you so much, Anne. That was a really great overview and incredibly inspirational to see how such radical change is possible. Uh, we all know with transition, there will always be challenges, but Orsted has really done a remarkable job at pivoting from being one of the most coal intensive energy companies in Europe to the world's most sustainable energy company and a global leader in the transition to green energy. And of course, it's always great to hear how you're leveraging geospatial technology and how it has supported and grown with you and Orsted as a company. I think in the grand scheme of things, it's always great to hear about how the community is leveraging geospatial technology and how it supported all of us as a community. Um, for a pivot ourselves now, in the next couple of presentations, we're going to de demonstrate the pre-work undertaken in site selection for renewable assets. So first, we'll hear from Jenna from RPS on the processes they undertake in the pre-build phase for a successful implementation of an offshore wind facility. Welcome, Jenna. Thanks, Alessandra. My name is Jenna Ducharme, and today I will be giving a presentation on the offshore wind energy planning with specific focus on ocean use data and visualization. Planning and permitting offshore wind energy project projects requires extensive understanding of the ocean uses within and surrounding the project location. Having comprehensive and robust spatial data related to those ocean uses that is easily accessible by everyone from developers, regulators, stakeholders, and the public is critical for successfully completing the various milestones along the project life cycle from planning, permitting, development, and operation, and to help balance the multiple uses of our ocean resources. The ocean is a busy place with constant human activity, biological activity, and physical changes, to name a few. It is important that as our knowledge and understanding grows, the data is easily accessible and available, so we all can make decisions based on a similar understanding. One example of a tool for understanding ocean use data is the Northeast Ocean Data Portal. 
It provides free user-friendly access to expert-reviewed interactive maps and data on ocean uses in the Northeastern United States. The Northeast Ocean Data Portal was established with regional partners in 2009, and it supported the development of the 2016 Northeast Ocean Plan. From then, it's continued to grow and meet the data needs of the Northeast region. It provides regionally specific geospatial data, scaled down national data, state compilations of data, and is all informed by stakeholders. The site is operated and kept up to date by the Northeast Ocean Data Portal Working Group, the members of which are noted on the left of the slide. We meet at a minimum on a weekly basis and are constantly adding new data, updating the usability of the site and creating communication materials for the user group. The site is Esri powered using data from map and feature services. There are over 5,000 data sources on the site available and sh that show the footprint of activities and resources. Products are derived from federal, state, tribal, research, academic, and stakeholder sources. It's informed and vetted by regional experts, agencies, and stakeholders. I'll quickly give you a walkthrough of the site. On the homepage, we have available theme maps with curated data. For example, an energy and infrastructure theme, which has a number of data sets of data layers available relating to planning areas for this sub theme. Each data layer is clickable with layer info and metadata documentation available. In this example, we also have an infrastructure sub theme showing infrastructure in the Northeast region. Returning to the home page, we can also view the data explorer where we can view those 5,000 data layers all at once <laughs> overlaying each other. For example, I'll load lease areas, the active renewable energy leases, as well as the bone pl wind planning areas. Again, each layer has layer information, metadata documentation, and most data layers have source data available where you can found, find download links and metadata. Additionally, you can load web services that you can bring into your own mapping products. To find out what's new on our site, you can view data updates, which are updated each time new data or tools are released, as well as news items. And to find more information about the site overall, you can view the about information. Finally, there's a video tour of the website and a highly active Twitter profile. You can also select to receive updates or email us for more information. With thousands of data sets, on the Northeast portal, each is unique and served, serves a different purpose. I'm going to highlight two data sets that serve very important roles for offshore wind and ocean use planning in particular. Vessel traffic from the Automatic Identification System or AIS data and fishing vessel activity data from VMS or Vessel Monitoring Systems. This is a very high level review of how these data are processed. You can reach out to any of the contacts at the end of this presentation or see metadata documentation available where the data is provided. AIS data is collected by the US Coast Guard from AIS equipped vessels. Since 2010, RPS has supported the NOAA Office for Coastal Management and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM, to improve access to and analysis of vessel traffic data. AIS consists of vessel position reports transmitted every two to 10 seconds, which amounts to a lot of data overall. It amounts to right around 3.5 gigabytes in a day and well over a terabyte in the year, in a year for the United States. Raw data also cannot be read by standard GIS software. RPS with NOAA and BOEM has developed an updated software to aid in the reading, processing, and analysis of AIS data. Tools were created to read the raw data, standardize and filter to one minute time steps to make it more usable overall. Filtered data is then loaded into, re into a relational database that allows rapid data queries, filtering and extraction. Monthly AIS data products are also prepared by UTM zone for more manageable distribution and analysis. And finally, tools were also created to prepare summary data products for analysis and review. 
Summary products include conversion of data points to track lines. Track lines connect points with the same vessel ID and uses the date time field within a point to connect a line. From individual track lines, we can then determine the density of lines in a given area. And we can also determine the number of times a given vessel has crossed a single cell. This allows us to see patterns of vessel, vessels that linger in a given area, such as a fish, fishing vessel, or those that might pass straight through a cell while underway. AIS data is available through many portals and websites, including NOAA's Marine Cadaster, the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Data Portal, and the Northeast Ocean Data Portal, to name a few. AIS data is important for the offshore wind industry to gain a better understanding of vessel traffic in the area of a project. I'll show an example of how to access this data on the Northeast Ocean Data Portal. You can select the Marine Transportation theme and the Commercial Traffic sub-theme. By scrolling down in the table of contents, you can select the data layer to gain access to the metadata documentation and layer information. Scrolling up, you can see we have data for a number of years, as well as vessel types from fishing vessels to tanker vessels. We can also view monthly aggregations of that data by clicking through a time slider on a month by month or playing an animation. Fishing activity data is also highly important to offshore wind and ocean use planning. It is important to understand fisheries resources and vessel traffic patterns. Data is made available by the National Marine Fisheries Service, NIMPS, Office of Law Enforcement. NIMPS describes VMS as a satellite surveillance system primarily used to monitor the location and movement of commercial fishing vessels in the United States. These data are subject to strict confidentiality and use constraints, and raw data is processed under confidentiality guidelines and aggregated by combining all program codes within each fishery plan. Aggregated products adhere to the rule of three, where no fewer than three VMS points were represented in any location across the suite of maps. The products are a broad characterization of fishing vessel activity, and the maps do not necessarily distinguish between fishing activity, vessel transit, and other vessel activities. There's two main data products made available. A density grid characterizing all VMS records for each time period and fishery. And second, a density grid that characterizes VMS records below a speed threshold. It is assumed that fishing activity is taking place when vessels are operating at reduced speeds. Density data, sh data shown below a speed threshold is thought to be more indicative of fishing activity. However, these products still likely show some non-fishing activities that occur at lower speeds. Speed thresholds were vetted with fishermen in each fishery. The most in accurate interpretation of these maps is that they indicate relative levels of vessel presence. Again, these data can be accessed in a couple of places on the Northeast portal. I'll show an example by selecting the commercial fishing theme map. And about this map box appears that should be read and understood, especially the data considerations. Data can be selected by radio button to show fisheries in different years. And a drop down can show different fisheries. Again, the layer information can be opened by selecting the hyperlink. And metadata documentation is important to be read and understood. I highlighted two key data sets with AIS and VMS information and how to access the data through curated theme maps on the right side of the homepage. I'll now show a use case example uh, to view these data as well as others in our data explorer. I'll start by loading under energy planning areas and lease areas, the active renewable energy leases and zoom into my area of interest. I'll load marine transportation navigation data for anchorage areas, traffic lanes, and submarine cables. I'll then also add commercial traffic data from 2019 for all vessels. If I select the active layers tab, I can change the layer drawing order. I'll then view monthly versions of the AIS data 
to find a month of interest. From here, I can turn off these data layers and but keep them available in the active layers tab. I can also completely remove them. I'll go back to the all layers tab and load commercial fishing data. Under vessel activity, I can select multi-species data from 2015 to 2016. I'll also highlight scallop data from 2015 to 2016 below that five knot threshold. In the active layers tab again, including metadata and web services. With that, thank you for listening. Below is listed a number of contacts you can reach out to with any questions on the Northeast Ocean Data Portal, this presentation, or more specific information about AIS and VMS data. For the Northeast Portal, you can also join our mail mailing list to receive a quarterly newsletter, visit our news page for frequent updates and events, as well as our Twitter page. Thank you, Jenna. Seeing this in the context of today's session was really helpful in realizing how many analogies can be made to offshore oil and gas sectors. One thing I wanna echo from your presentation was your statement of making available the same authoritative data source to multiple parties ensures a common understanding. And the use of web services and ArcGIS portal seems to have really helped make that possible. Continuing our theme of optimizing asset location, we'll now hear from Lisa Tunnel at Res. Her topic is a little similar to Jenna's presentation with RPS. However, Lisa will discuss the considerations when placing solar power farms and how Res is ex extending the ArcGIS platform through innovative customization. Over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Alessandra. My name is Lisa Tunnel. I'm the Global GIS Solutions Architect for Res Group LTD. And today I wanna to talk a little bit about location strategy and how we leverage our ArcGIS portal for solar site selection. So who is Res Group? Well, the Res and Res Group is short for Renewable Energy Systems. We provide utility scale renewable energy services to multiple countries throughout the world. We develop, construct, and operate wind, solar, storage, and transmission and distribution services. We have over 39 years of experience, over 3,000 employees, and our portfolio includes 19 gigawatts of wind, solar, and storage projects. We also continue to maintain seven gigawatts of our supported assets, and we're one of the leaders in battery storage projects throughout the world at 337 megawatts. Around the globe, we have three ArcGIS enterprise deployments and multiple users of ArcGIS Pro, Collector, and other Esri softwares. So why ArcGIS Portal? Well, the solution I'm gonna to show today uses Web App Builder in Portal. Web App Builder is included with ArcGIS Enterprise and provides a very easy way to create web user interfaces for users. This allows us to target specific user groups. We can use either the out of the box widgets that Web App Builder supplies or create custom tools and widgets. If a web uh, out of the box widget isn't available that we want to use, we can actually go online and find new widgets. There's a lot of people who actually have created widgets that we can use. If that doesn't fit our needs, we can also create brand new widgets just using the JavaScript API. In addition, Portal allows us to provide our users with the right data every time. What I mean by that is before using ArcGIS Enterprise, we were doing what many people were doing, and we had data on our network drive or a C drive in multiple formats like KMZ or CSVs or shapefiles. We would copy the data, it'd get lost or altered, and it just wasn't a good system. Arc GIS Portal is a distributed system that uses web services. These services can be shared real time in a multitude of different software formats. 
We use web services in Portal, ArcGIS Pro, Collector, Power BI, Excel, PowerPoint, and we're looking into using the ArcGIS for AutoCAD plugin so that we can work with our engineers a lot closer. My demonstration today is going to showcase two custom tools that we have developed for use with Web App Builder. I want to briefly highlight and explain these tools. So the first tool that I would like to highlight is our buildable area widget. This widget allows us to clip out constraints out of a specific area that we have identified that we think would be a good area to build a solar farm. We use Model Builder in ArcGIS Pro to create a model. And then we use the geoprocessing widget in Web App Builder to use that, that tool. It provides a tool to our users that would allow them to adequately, adequately assess the usefulness of a site before doing the footwork of talking to landowners. This saves us a lot of time and energy. The second tool is our solar calc widget. This widget is a completely customized widget that we built with ArcGIS JavaScript API. We use custom script in the background that allows us to calculate the maximum DC and AC capacities and the yield of a specific targeted area. This gives us a preview of the money that we will make essentially on a specific area and what the outputs would be in the long term. So with that, I'm going to get to our demo. So this is our solar prospecting web app builder app that we've built in ArcGIS portal. This is a very simple out of the box solution where we have some out of the box tools, including an analysis tool that's going to allow our users to export data. It's also going to show the layer list where we can turn layers on and off and a legend and allow them to add new data. We also have a select tool in a measurement tool. And then we have our two custom tools, our buildable area tool and our solar calc tool. What I'm going to do is turn on some layers here. And what we want to do when we are prospecting for a solar site is we want to try to find a site that is close to a substation and close to transmission lines. So for this site, I've turned on my parcels. I also want to try to find parcels that are large enough to where maybe we only have to talk to one landowner or maybe just a couple of landowners. So let's just say that I think that this area over here might be a good area to, to build a solar farm. You can see I've already been kind of looking at these areas down here, but maybe I want to go out a little bit more and, and look at this area over here. I'll go ahead and turn those off. And let's turn on our buildable area widget, which, as I said, is a geoprocessing widget um, that we have put in a model builder geoprocessing tool. Um, I am just going to select a square. I'm going to highlight an area here. And then I'm going to push run. So while that's running, we'll just go ahead and take a look at some of these other areas that I already have. Um, what this tool is going to do is it clips out all of the constraints that are not good areas for, for building a, a solar farm. 
Now our wind farm areas are gonna have different constraints. So this buildable area tool would clip out different things. If I increase my setbacks and my constraints over here, we'll see I have roads and flow lines, pipelines, transmission lines, um, wetlands and things like that in my constraints. And I also have certain setbacks that are specific to solar setbacks. And that is what this tool is doing, is it's clipping all of those things out. So you can see that my output, if I turn on my flow lines, it should turn everything on. And we'll be able to do a little bit farther, further of an assessment of exactly which constraints were taken out of this clip. So we can see the majority of it here are flow lines. It looks like we might have some um, pipelines in there also. And then we have some wetlands. So that is the crux of what that tool does, um, which is extremely useful for our developers as they're trying to really assess a, a particular area. And if we even want to spend the time to go out and talk to this landowner, if they had way too many um, constraints on their property, then, then it probably wouldn't even be worth talking to that land agent or that landowner. The second tool I'd like to discuss today is our solar calc widget. So this widget is actually a custom widget that we use the Esri JavaScript API to create. This tool is going to help us to decide where the most energy comes from in a solar, in a solar farm. Um, so I'm going to turn off a couple of these layers over here so we get a little bit clearer view. And what we are left with here is this buildable area that we just created. Uh, now with the solar calc uh, widget, we can come in here and kind of choose what type of solar we're going to be installing. Um, and we can maybe do this a few different times with different types of defaults to see what the energy output is going to be of each different type of solar that we deploy here. If I choose this thin film standard, it's going to give us and tell us what module and inverter it's using. And the bifacial is going to change a little bit and just kind of give us the specifications of that specific type of solar. Uh, we might come in here and define an azimuth. Um, and then that will change. We could also type into here if we have a specific azimuth that we need to meet. Um, and then from here, we can choose a buildable area. And we can include as much of this as we want. And we can also, in addition, we can either leave it like that or we can draw an additional area. Maybe we need to add this area into it. Once we have defined what our buildable area is going to be, we'll push this Generate Design button. Now, while that's working, I'll just show you here that it does go ahead and calculate the acreage that we're doing the buildable area on. Um, and we can delete you know, certain acreages if we need to do that. So when that tool is done, you can see that it filled out all of our buildable areas with a solar farm. Zoom in here and we can see all of our different rows. Now what's also really nice about this is that after it built it, it's going to calculate our max DC capacity, our yields, uh, our nominal AC capacities, our maximum export capacities. These are numbers that are going to help our developers to decide if this solar farm would make us any money. Um, 
and that's of course really important to know as early as you possibly can before we really get into the process of developing the land and then realize that it's not going to make us any money later in the process. We can also click on any of these and we might delete some of them. And every time we delete some of these, it's going to recalculate those numbers. And it, this particular soil farm is not going to make too big of a difference because it's so big. But um, at a smaller solar farm, deleting some of those, you would see some of these numbers change. So that is essentially what, what the solar calc widget does. And we can come in and do multiple ones and kind of look at the areas all around and, and decide upon the best places to target for our solar farms. And that is all that I have today. I'll hand it back to you. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, so Lisa, we've worked together for years and I always love the insight and innovative growth you've been responsible for at Res, and we always look forward to seeing what you accomplish next. And of course, for anyone watching, if you have any questions for Lisa, please feel free to add them to the Q&A box to the right of this screen. So we're now going to be shifting gears to invite a couple of presentations focusing on how GIS is helping to create better, greater efficiency, reduce downtime, and increase safety, and ultimately improve ROI. Both examples will focus on challenges in wind power, one at the construction phase and the other in operational maintenance. I know many of you, again, probably have questions on how to custom extend the ArcGIS platform for your organizational needs. So like I said, put those questions to the right and um, we'll answer questions from Lisa's presentation at the end. So next, Please allow me to introduce Sean Ireland from Ramball to demonstrate how GIS and related technologies can help answer critical questions for offshore wind development from building and engineering and construction supply chain to minimizing environmental impacts. Over to you, Sean. Thanks, Alessandra. My name is Sean Ireland and I am a senior consultant at Ramble working primarily on renewable energy projects and more specifically projects related to offshore wind. The title of this, of this presentation is Spatial Data Analysis to Inform Offshore Wind Infrastructure Development. And briefly, I'm going to first talk about Ramble and its history with offshore wind and then introduce a project example that I'll use for the bulk of the presentation. And then I'll work through a couple of specific areas in which we rely heavily on GIS, and then I'll wrap up from there. But first, for those of you, for those of you who don't know, Ramble is an international engineering, architecture, and consultancy company that operates out of 35 countries around the world and employs over 16,000 people. The markets that Ramble operates in are wide ranging and include things like building design, transportation, water, energy, as well as several others. Ramble has also been a world leading wind energy consultant since 1986 for onshore projects and 1989 for offshore wind projects. Overall, there are over 300 wind energy experts in the company that have been involved in more than 70% of all global offshore wind farms. On top of that, Ramble has created the detailed designs of more than 60% of all offshore substructures. I'll also mention that the offshore wind services we provide are wide ranging. I'll only have time to touch on two of them, but Ramble continues to be heavily involved in all aspects of the wind farm development process. Now to introduce a specific project that I'll be using to walk through some of the ways GIS has helped us perform this type of work. So Ramble was the lead consultant for the, the development of New Jersey's offshore wind strategic plan. The state of New Jersey, as you may already know, has made some large commitments to renewable energy. And a big part of that is expected to come from offshore wind. So Ramble facilitated the development of a type of roadmap for how New Jersey will achieve these commitments. The plan touches on a number of topics, including things like fisheries and energy markets, but the two that I'm going to focus on are environmental and natural resource protection and supply chain development. Like I've said, GIS is an essential part of the work that we do. It's really hard to imagine being able to do this work uh, to answer the real world questions our clients are interested in without the help of GIS. 
And I want to introduce two important questions that our team is often tasked with answering for a client. The first is, where are suitable onshore locations where wind components can be uh, stored and assembled? And this is a supply chain challenge that really forces us to think about the infrastructure necessary to wind farm construction. And then the second question is, where can offshore wind projects be located to avoid impacts to sensitive marine biological resources? And this is also a challenging question about the environmental impacts that these wind farms can produce. We want to know where the where and what impacts to the environment are likely and how can we leverage that knowledge to minimize these impacts. Jumping into the first question about supply chain, offshore wind turbine components require huge amounts of onshore space for storage and assembly. Uh, these, these components are massive. For reference, most offshore wind turbine blades, like the one you see in the image, are longer than a football field. And the height of the full turbine can be approximately 800 or 900 plus feet, which again, for reference, is twice as tall as the Statue of Liberty. So again, where can blades that are longer than a football field be stored? And how can they even be transported from where they are manufactured? Since they are too large to be transported by road or rail, a vessel is really the only other feasible option, which limits the possible storage or staging locations to ports. And really the same can be said for many of the other turbine components like foundations and towers. These are all very large and very heavy components and require lots of space and supporting machinery like heavy lift cranes. So you can see why ports are of interest to anyone wanting to construct an offshore wind farm. So under the supply chain umbrella of offshore wind projects we work on, one of the main tasks that our client rely on us to complete for them are essentially port assessments. Which existing ports would be suitable to support offshore wind supply chain or what coastal properties could potentially be developed into a port? And these are the questions we helped answer in the New Jersey strategic plan. We evaluated ports and coastal properties in New Jersey for their potential to support offshore wind development. And how do we do this? To start, we use GIS to develop a spatial database of New Jersey ports and coastal properties. GIS software really allowed us to integrate existing spatial layers, which are pu publicly available with our own knowledge of ports and properties from other projects. So with that, we could create a single usable spatial database where we could effectively store, edit, and manage some of the key attributes associated with each port. Things like property area, channel depths, overhead restrictions, distance to the different lease areas, which you can see in the figure, these are all important pieces of information which we use for a type of suitability analysis based on the needs or preferences provided by the client. So for example, if the client was only interested in ports in a particular state or geographic region with say greater than 40 acres of available area and a minimum channel or berthing depth of 35 feet, our spatial database is set up to quickly be able to identify the ports that fit this criteria. In the case of the New Jersey strategic plan, we went through several rounds of review to bring us from dozens of options to a much smaller group of ports that we could then focus additional efforts on. And this ultimately helped lead to a site being chosen by the state to invest in and develop a port along the Delaware River on the coast of New Jersey. And this site is currently the largest purpose-built offshore wind port in the country, or rather it will be when it's operational. Moving on to the next question, which is where can offshore wind projects be located to avoid impacts to biological resources? For the New Jersey project, we are tasked with evaluating the potential impacts to these resources in a study area off the coast of New Jersey. And we specifically wanted to know where these impacts were likely to be the greatest so that we could then provide a recommendation to the state for the siting of wind projects. And by impacts, I mean things like the possible disturbance of species during construction or the maintenance or, uh, uh, or disturbing important habitats and other related impacts. Much like the ports question, this task required us to compile large amounts of spatial data related to biological resources, which I'll talk more about on the next slide and then combining and analyzing that data in a way that's helpful and allows us to create some intuitive visualizations. 
So the team needed to collect hundreds of data sets and spatial layers that represent key biological resources, which you can see in the graphic on the slide. Data such as the relative abundance of specific species or groups of species, and particularly those that are threatened or endangered. Also data sets related to sensitive marine areas like coral reefs or designated critical habitat, essential fish habitat. These are all important data or layers that we use to help identify the areas off the coast of New Jersey that are most vulnerable to offshore wind development and ultimately create some maps and figures that clearly show areas where developers should consider avoiding in order to help protect these, uh, these resources. But before these maps could be made, the data needed to go through a, a process of being standardized, which in this case meant transforming the data into a standard raster format, which was an important step that allowed this data to be combined and classified during a type of weighted sum analysis. And the suite of geoprocessing tools within the ArcGIS program was essential to the process of working the, the hundreds of data sets into this standard format that we could actually use for the weighted sum analysis, which also relied on perhaps familiar uh, uh, geoprocessing tools in ArcGIS. To give you an idea of a sort of final project for the set of analyses, the figure on the slide shows the relative susceptibility of biological resources to offshore wind development. The darker area is showing higher susceptibility and the lighter color is showing less susceptibility. And like I've said, this was the result of a weighted sum analysis, which allowed us to create a composite layer for visualizing overall susceptibility. And these results are now informing New Jersey about where to develop projects that meet their goals while also minimizing impacts to the environment. So to wrap up, GIS is essential to the work Ramble does with renewable energy and particularly offshore wind. And while I only touched on two services, Ramble's wind energy capabilities go well beyond these services. And the same can be said about our use of GIS within these services. And finally, I'll just mention again that these types of projects, uh, this type of work has really reached a tipping point. The market is rapidly expanding across the globe, which is exciting for a number of reasons, but I'm specifically excited to see the new ways in which GIS will end up playing a role in this expanding market. And with that, I'll end by giving you some contact information in case you wanted to reach out with questions or anything else. Uh, I'll also be available to take questions during the slotted time after the session. That was another really great presentation on how useful geospatial technologies are to these very extensive and complicated offshore projects. Environmental impact assessments are a really important step in any energy project, both oil and gas and renewables. And we deeply appreciate you sharing your expertise, experience, uh, especially in this rapidly expanding market in offshore renewable energy. Next, we'll go over to Keith at Anel Green Power, who is using GIS for operational maintenance on an everyday basis, including monitoring lightning strikes in near real time and pushing the information out to potentially impacted staff out in the field, which is key to minimizing downtime and giving field staff one source of truth while keeping them safe. Please take it away, Keith. Well, thanks for the introduction. My name is Keith Aubin. I'm the chapter leader of the geographical information platform at NL North America. So I represent the, the IT side of our organization and am focusing on GIS as a platform for NL. A little bit about Enel. Uh, we are the world's largest network operator and the largest player in the renewable industry space and the largest retail customer base worldwide. Uh, we operate in 32 countries with over 49 gigawatts of renewable capacity and are on track to triple that um, by 2030 and have a pledge to be carbon neutral by 2050. Um, in North America, we operate over six gigawatts of renewable energy projects. Uh, including wind, solar, and geothermal technology, with the largest growth right now being in the wind and solar industries, and in particular, the Texas markets. So this presentation, I hope to show everybody some examples of how we can make uh, some real-time solutions in our ArcGIS enterprise, or even ArcGIS online environments, 
um, using low code and other automation solutions. In particular, webhooks are a very powerful piece of technology to integrate uh, systems operating on, on different networks and different domains to be able to exchange information. Uh, so what you're seeing in front of you here is a screenshot of our lightning strike dashboard and alerting system. So this was primarily built using ArcGIS Enterprise uh, with Geo Event Server. You know, some interesting developments uh, from Esri or their new uh, our ArcGIS Online uh, Velocity. Um, so that could be another approach to do a very similar uh, solution. Um, but in this example, we're using uh, Geo Event Server. Uh, so for those unfamiliar with Geo Event Server, it is a tool that's part of ArcGIS Enterprise that allows us to consume real-time data, uh, process it, and um, you know display it in our web maps uh, very efficiently. So on this uh, dashboard you can see here, on the left side, we're showing the number of standard alerts and critical alert lightning strikes uh, currently uh, focused on what's shown in this current map view. Uh, as you zoom out, it will you know, show the entire portfolio. So in this example here, we can see that there were six critical strikes at this wind farm uh, in the past 30 days. Uh, and so the definition of what a critical strike is, is in the upper right hand corner. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, other recent capabilities that we've added to this platform is integration with our Aussie Soft Pi server. So that is a SCADA aggregation system um, that aggregates all the different operating metrics from our plants worldwide uh, and provides them through a REST interface uh, that we're able to leverage through our Geo Event Server and integrate that data as well into our map. Um, we'll be primarily focusing on uh, lightning alerts, but I wanted to point that out as well. So the primary features of this uh, solution that we're going to present here are real-time alerts with custom distribution lists. Um, and in particular, we leverage survey one, two, three to uh, create a sign-up process for those distribution lists. And we're gonna cover how we interconnected all those processes together using webhooks in an automation platform called Integromat. Um, in that dashboard, we can view current and historical lightning strikes. And as I mentioned earlier, the integration with our Pi server to show the real-time operational status of wind turbines. And uh, so going over the, the business requirement that was supplied to our group um, was that there's a new operational requirement for the inspections of wind turbines after a lightning strike meeting the following criteria below. So an amplitude um, lower than negative 75 kiloamps or greater than one kiloamp with a duration of more than 10 seconds. Uh, so the positive amplitude lightning strikes are the ones that are most likely to cause damage. And while our turbines are equipped with lightning attenuation systems, uh, they're not foolproof and occasionally can be damaged by lightning strikes. Uh, so with the solution we're gonna present here, we'll show how uh, as lightning strikes happen in real time, uh, messages are provided to our field personnel where they're able to then log into our dashboard and evaluate that lightning strike, other activity in the area, as well as the operational status of that turbine. Uh, so they can make a rapid decision of if that turbine is showing a fault code to perhaps shut it down to prevent further damage. Um, but as a general operating practice, after a lightning strike, when the weather's clear the following morning, they uh, should go out to the site and then do an inspection. Uh, quite frequently, uh, we're using drones for those inspections. So they're able to get up there close and look for any damage. And this can save us quite a lot of money by uh, identifying problems before they propagate. So a turbine blade is a big piece of fiberglass, just like a boat hull. So a small crack in it that could have been caused by a lightning strike or um, sublimation of uh, the fiberglass can propagate over time. And a, what would be a cheaper repair can eventually turn into a very expensive repair or a catastrophic failure. So systems like this allow us to uh, stay on top of maintenance activities. So you can see on the lower left here, uh, this is what a typical alert lightning strike will look like. It's listing the project name, that code is our internal SAP plant code, and then the project name. And this alert was triggered for wind turbine C14 and it's showing the date, amplitude, and duration. So on this next slide here, we're showing the data process flow. So we're receiving this data from a weather service provider called DTN. What's really great about this company is they provide all of these streams of data in a native uh, Esri feature service formats. So they're very easy to integrate into your ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS portal environments. You can just bring them in, store the credentials, and then uh, add them to your maps. Uh, so what 
is happening is we have our ArcGIS Geo Event Server that is monitoring that feed coming from DTN, along with coming from our relational data store, the geo fences of the particular turbines that we are monitoring. So I'm just gonna back up here and you can see those red circles around each wind turbine. Those are the alert areas for a critical lightning strike. So that's the turbine tip height plus 100 meters, which is the spatial accuracy of the lightning data supplied by DTN. So it's a pretty high probability that if a lightning strike took place inside of that radius, it hit the wind turbine. Uh, so the geo event server takes in that uh, DTN feature service and the geo fences, it analyzes it, it outputs ones that uh, meet our criteria into a spatial temporal data store as an alert strike. And that database grows larger over time and allows us to uh, determine trends. And uh, at the end of this, I'll do a live demo and show an example of what that can look like. Um, so one of the other outputs of the geo event server is it's passing a webhook to Integromat. Uh, so uh, many of you may be aware of Integromat. It's a very useful tool, especially if you're using Survey123 uh, to automate downstream processes. Um, but you can make uh, webhooks from Geo Event Server just the same. And then the reason why we're using this is we have our distribution list system and we're sending out notifications through Office 365. While Geo Event Server itself can send email notifications, we have a more uh, intricate process that breaks them down depending on someone. Uh, whether a user is subscribed to all alerts, alerts for a particular generation technology like wind or solar, or alerts just for a specific plant. And that's a much easier process for us to manage uh, using uh, Integromat and Office 365. So here is a little bit of insight to what's going on behind the scenes inside of Geo Event Server. So this is the processor here. And you can see on the left, the input is the cloud to ground lightning strike that's coming from DTN. We're using the geo tagger to identify if that lightning strike is inside of our project boundary alert areas. Um, so what that is, is it's our, our project boundary plus two kilometers. So we're, we're cataloging all the lightning that's falling anywhere near our plants. Um, so then, then it passes it on to the next filter. So if the project is not equal to null, it continues along this path. So then that means that lightning strike has fallen within inside our alert area. And we are now doing another geo tagger to identify which particular asset that lightning strike is correlated with. So which turbine, uh, which uh, inverter for a solar project or which met tower uh, and, and items like that. So the, the next process that happens here uh, basically breaks down whether this is a critical alert strike or not. Um, and if it's a critical alert strike, it's going to be passed, you can see in the, the upper right hand corner uh, to a JSON output to Integromat. Um, but in any event, they all go into our spatial temporal big data store. So you can see all those paths uh, converging together. So that's a little bit of insight of how this process works in Geo Event Manager. Uh, so here's an example of how to create a webhook to Integromat uh, from Geo Event Server. It's actually quite simple. You just set up an output push to JSON external website. And you can see here, um, you can give it whatever name that pleases you. And you'd simply input the URL that you generated um, on Integromat for that particular webhook. You can see here, I blurred out our particular URL, but all you would have to do on Integromat is make a new input webhook, um, set up a new listening um, a webhook, and then paste in that, uh, that URL here. And then on the right, you can see what information is being passed to Integromat. So you can see that bundle that is including the object ID, amps, date, time, and everything else relevant to that uh, lightning strike. And here's an example of how this distribution list process works and why we're choosing to use Integromat for this. And you know what's great about this solution is this is a low code situation or pretty much no code in, the, in this uh, uh, example here. So the webhook is received from Geo Event Server. It's now being routed to whether it matches the criteria of all projects for a specific technology or for a specific project. So there's some, some filtering going on there to pass it down those particular paths. And then we're storing the distribution list in an Office 365 Excel spreadsheet. And it's actually quite simple. We have one worksheet for each distribution list. And then the Integromat process aggregates that into an array 
and puts it into an email that's sent through our Office 365 connection. And you can see on the right what the output of one of these alerts look like. So this is uh, going to show you now how you can manage a distribution list starting with survey one, two, three. Um, this is by no means the only way that you can do this. This is just a, a pretty a good example of how you can use survey one, two, three for things beyond collecting information in the field. Uh, so in this example here, we're collecting data or the, the user's uh, subscriptions via a survey one, two, three distribution form, which is then being passed to Integromat through its connector to watch survey from uh, survey one, two, three. That's a specific connector available in Integromat. Um, and because uh, Integromat does have some limitations and how much we can manipulate data. We chose to use a custom, uh, excuse me, a custom Python process uh, to actually parse the response from survey one, two, three and update our Excel worksheet. And, and the way that we're doing that is through Jenkins. So Jenkins is a DevOps tool and we've exposed a webhook to Jenkins via a reverse proxy in IIS. And that allows us to have a great deal of flexibility on exactly how we manipulate the data to put it in that Excel worksheet. Again, there's other ways that you could approach this. Uh, this is just what worked for us. And we're gonna go into a bit more detail on how all this works. So here's a couple screenshots of the survey one, two, three form. Um, as you can see, we had to put a little bit of a warning up there because you do need a uh, field worker or a level two creator license in order to use survey one, two, three, even on the web. Um, most of our users that are in our operations group have that level of access, but in the event that they don't, we direct them to our site support page where they can request access through Anel's identity management systems. And you can see on this form here that it's pulled my username from our single sign-on uh, user accounts and my email address from my profile from a uh, portal, again, passed through single sign-on. So no need for the user to enter that information. And then they simply select whether they want to subscribe to alerts, unsubscribe from alerts, and if they subscribe to alerts, they can pick which one as they want. They can pick all plants, they can pick uh, generation technology, or in this example here, I'm subscribing to all solar, solar alerts and then three particular wind plants. So whenever a lightning strikes any of our solar operations, I would be notified or those particular wind plants. So here's a screenshot of how this process then works inside of Integromat. Um, and so that we're watching again that survey and we have a router here based off of the selection. So if they selected unsubscribe, it's going to go down and that HTTP make a request is calling the webhook that we set up on our Jenkins server um, and is passing along that the user has uh, requested to unsubscribe. And after that webhook is successfully completed, it sends an email to the user confirming that they've been unsubscribed. And then uh, the other route is if they chose to subscribe to a particular project uh, or all projects, it goes one of two routes. If they subscribe all projects, it um, you know adds them to that particular list. And if they subscribe to a, a, a sub selection, it, it activates that other route there. And due to the way that we set up our, our custom Python script to make it more simple, um, that's why we have two routes here. I'm not gonna go into the full details on, on how that script works, because there's certainly many ways that you could go about approaching it. We originally attempted to uh, do all of this in Integromat, but you know, ran into some limitations. It's not the most flexible platform in the world for more advanced data manipulation, uh, even though it can connect to an Excel spreadsheet and update it. So we, we opted to use the Python script. And again, we use Jenkins because that's a tool we use for many other automations tasks. But other ways that this could also be accomplished is you could take that Python script and publish it as a geoprocessing tool and call it that way. It could be published as an AWS Lambda functions or to whatever other DevOps platform that your organization utilizes. Uh, so again, there's no right or wrong. It's whatever works best and you're best able to support. So showing what this looks like in the Office 365 Excel spreadsheet, um, you know, looking on the right here, we can see our spreadsheet in column A just simply has the list of all the people who are, have subscribed to the distribution list. And on the bottom are all the different worksheets in this uh, Excel workbook. So each one of those is an individual distribution list. And, you know, looking at the process that I showed you earlier of how the webhooks are passed from our geo event server and are then reading this Excel file that you see on the right to aggregate that into an array and send the appropriate notification. So 
uh, any alert that comes in is going to trigger that route for all projects. And you can see there the second tab for the worksheets is all projects. It's going to notify everybody on that list. Uh, so if we have an alert coming in for a solar or let's say a wind uh, turbine had been struck, that's going to trigger the route for the wind technology. And you can see again down there, uh, there's a worksheet for wind and those people would be notified. And then if uh, for the specific project, it would trigger that route and then also notify people subscribing to that particular process. And the way that we can keep people from getting multiple notifications was through our survey one, two, three form. We added enough logic to it that it's impossible for somebody to uh, subscribe to all wind projects and then also subscribe to an individual wind project. Um, so that logic is controlled through uh, the input from the user uh, via survey one, two, three. It's extremely uh, versatile in that uh, capability. Okay. As I promised before, here's a live demonstration of our, our lightning dashboard. So we can see here on the right, uh, some re recent lightning strikes. And I'm just going to zoom in on one of those plants and we'll show you how this all works. So here's our, our Osage wind farm. And we can see that it did have, in fact, a couple of uh, recent critical lightning strikes. And in this example here, we can see that this particular strike uh, took place on the 9th and that this turbine is uh, down for maintenance right now for repairs. Uh, so you can show that in, in this one interface that a lot of actionable information is readily available. Um, other things that we can do here are we can apply various map filters to better look for trends. So we can filter for by time, the default is 30 days, but we can go ahead and flip this on to all time. And all time being when we started recording uh, lightning strikes, which is around last July. So right away, you can see some trends here that certain wind turbines are more susceptible to being struck versus other wind turbines. And this gives the information necessary to our operations crew uh, to optimize their maintenance procedures. They can inspect the ones more frequently struck more often and forego as frequent inspections on the ones that are uh, less impacted by lightning. Um, other things that we can do is change the heat map from our monitored assets to um, within two kilometers of our, our project boundary, which can give a little bit more insight into uh, some of the lightning activity, in particular what happened during this uh, storm not long ago. So that's the, the end of this presentation. And I hope this got you all thinking about how you can use webhooks in your organization. It's really clear to see that you've built a very impressive set of procedures for real-time asset monitoring that protects workers, improves efficiency, and potentially has significant impact on the bottom line. Thank you so much. So now a bit of a pivot of our own. Geothermal energy has been receiving a significant amount of positive attention. And I wanted to introduce you to Malcolm Ross to discuss some of the operational considerations of newer commercial scale systems and how they are reducing barriers to entry for some strategic investors. Many of you will probably know Malcolm from his long association with the PUG from a geotechnical perspective, and it's a pleasure to have him with us today in his capacity as a strategic advisor to ever. Malcolm, welcome back to the PUG. Hello, everyone. I'm Malcolm Ross. Um, I'm a longtime uh, geoscientist and longtime PUG contributor. My con connection to PUG goes back to the days when we used to meet at the JW Marriott. Uh, we managed the list. And our logo was a bulldog with lipstick. So my history goes way back. Uh, I've been using GIS and geoscientists for, uh, geosciences for a long time. And I wanted to show you the latest in, in what's going on in that space uh, from a geothermal point of view. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And I'm currently uh, affiliated with the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, different kinds of geothermal systems are uh, classical geothermal, uh, thinking of steam boiling out of the pipes in the, in the, in the ground. Um, and uh, those are the classical kinds of geothermal that you th think of. Um, the uh, cutting edge of the geothermal world now is what's called enhanced geothermal or engineered geothermal, EGS systems uh, where instead of looking for rocks with particular uh, aquifers and, and porosity and permeability and surface expression, uh, enhanced geothermal creates it for itself. Essentially by creating uh, fractures in the rock with hydraulic fracturing, uh, fracking, 
and then pumping their own fluid down and expecting to get it back through those fractures um, and get it heated up and bring it back to the surface. Latest generation of this has gone very horizontal and has borrowed a lot from the unconventional world of oil and gas. But the really cutting edge of this now is in closed loop geothermal and that advanced geothermal systems. And I'm, that's what I'm gonna talk to you about. But first let's talk about the overall benefits of geothermal. And what I just wanna point out to you here are the temperature ranges um, uh, really going from 70 degrees F, 30, 35 degrees C, all the way up to 400 or more. Um, and not just making electricity as I've got circled here, but also making hydrogen and ethanol and biofuels, et cetera, um, and connecting these things up so that the waste product of one connects as the input for another. And the waste product for that one is an input for another, et cetera. And you can see how these things can be daisy chained together, creating a value stream with multiple inputs. It also gives you the opportunity to optimize these things so that in the wintertime you do more of one and summertime you do more of another. And that uh, optimizes your revenue stream even more. There are challenges too, and that's what I wanna to touch on next. I'm not gonna go through all of them. I encourage you to halt the recording and, or the playback and read these for yourself. I just wanted to touch uh, on the exploration success um, one here where uh, you find that up to 50% of the geothermal wells um, that are drilled for classical geothermal do not encounter the geology that they need, the porosity, the permeability, the aquifers, et cetera. Um, and those dry holes are very expensive because the drilling and casing cost is very high to drill at, at those temperatures and with those bore diameters. Uh, I will also touch on the second page here on number eight, the induced seismicity subsidence problem where if you are extracting fluids from the subsurface or extracting and injecting fluids into the subsurface, you can either create subsidence um, and or seismicity because you're changing the stress state by extracting fluids, dropping their temperatures, injecting them, um, and that can cause induced uh, earthquakes. Uh, and there have been five projects shut down because of earthquakes, to my knowledge, after tens of millions of dollars investment. So that's a serious challenge. So how do we get away from those challenges? Well, closed loop, I believe, is part of the answer. So uh, this is uh, the technology from a company called Ever, uh, called the Ever Loop. And what you see here around the margins is not decoration. That's actually one of their designs. You've got wells um, about five kilometers apart, three to five kilometers deep. Um, and they go, uh, two, two bores go down and they are connected by a family of multilaterals. And so you can imagine a fluid, cold fluid going down, pumping through those multilaterals, picking up heat, eventually getting hot, going back to the surface, that heat being exploited, and then that cold fluid going back down and going back through the opposite kind of circuit. Um, that makes for a very small surface expression. Uh, I encourage you to read um, some of these benefits here. Um, I will uh, focus on the closed loop thermal siphon effect where the density, cold, dense or material going down weighs less than the hot, less dense fluid going up. And that means that there is a siphon effect. So you can run a, therm a closed loop system without pumps. And that's parasitic load of something like 20% that you can um, now sell instead of having to use. I also point out the uh, multilateral uh, approach here. Um, that's how you can get away with going to shallower depths because you're exposing yourself to much more rock. Um, uh, and to avoid the casing cost, can't avoid the drilling cost. So lower cost drilling is always going to be better here. But to avoid the casing, the casing cost, these wells are drilled as open hole. And a polymer is used to seal these in the subsurface so that you get no interaction with the environment. Um, but you don't have to pay for, in this case, five kilometers times 15 multilaterals. Uh, you're talking about 75 kilometers of steel, which you don't have to pay for. Uh, here's a, a, on the right here is a design uh, working with now, it's called a James Joyce geometry, where there's essentially folded back upon itself. And now you have only one location uh, where everything happens, the drilling, all the production, 
um, at, in one small surface footprint. Uh, so let's talk about pros and cons now because we talked about advantage and disadvantages. Uh, closed loop system, um, no need to find a, a porosity and permeability, aquifer, none of that. Um, no interaction with the environment, um, uh, no pumps required, no fracking required, no uh, seismicity, no subsidence. You can see why um, there is some very interesting advantages to the uh, closed loop system. Note that the target bottom hole temperatures right now are in the 150 degrees C range. So they're below the temperature um, ranges of classical geothermal. And what that means is um, you can actually now spread out where you can do this because now your target temperatures are lower and here's where you can get those, um, uh, those things in the uh, sedimentary basins of the world. And this is temperature and uh, depth. And uh, you can see how now 70% of the world is now open to geothermal to where in the past, the Ring of Fire, Iceland, Hawaii, Italy, a little bit of, uh, of Italy and, and Turkey uh, were the hot spots in the earth. And a lot of other places couldn't have it. But now you're talking about a much more geothermal anywhere sort of approach. Here's a, another view. Um, now we're talking about Central and Western North America. This is depth to a particular temperature. Uh, in this case, the red represents shallow depth, five kilometers depth. Um, and the deep stuff is where essentially those temperatures are too deep to be accessible uh, by drilling. And you can see the predominance, why geothermal predominates in the Western US, but there are hot spots in the East uh, and in Texas, for example, where geothermal, if the sedimentary column was thick enough and you could do an ever loop, um, where geothermal might just work. And you could, you could do it close to the customer rather than somewhere off far in the far distant area. Here's an overlay of uh, basins. So here is where things are um, thick enough, have the sedimentary pile that, that you can drill into. And finally, uh, here are customers. Um, so uh, there's an interesting sort of duality here where the highest temperatures and the best geothermal are far, far from the population centers in the center and the eastern US. Um, and so you can see why in the US, the focus is on electricity generations so that you can put it on the grid. Here's the grid. Uh, and get it distributed to your customer. But if you can do it in Texas or some of these closer to these population centers, then you can uh, go direct to the customer and not have to go to electricity in order to transmit your energy to your customer. Uh, last point, here's a, a common risk segment map uh, analysis for the Netherlands to support um, the exploration of the Netherlands for Everloop systems. Uh, this is a depth, depth map. Um, and uh, green is the best depth, and red is is the is uh, less advantageous depths. Uh, here's an overlay of uh, thickness, and you know where the best thicknesses are, which isn't necessarily the thickest, but the Goldilocks right thickness. Uh, and then, of course, the the approach with the common risk segment maps is you put those two maps together and and find where you get the the best of both worlds, and that's what this is a, a map showing. Uh, where uh, you can talk about where the uh, you get both the thickness and the depths that are optimal for closed loop geothermal. And you can see wh where uh, in the Netherlands it might be smart to be looking to ever type loops for energy generation. So thank you much, very much, everyone. And I look forward to discussing this more with you during Q&A. Thank you. Uh, firstly, to everybody who's listening, apologies, we have been having some technical issues. Alessandro and myself have been trying to smile through while trying to juggle everything with the backstage team as well, so we do apologize. Uh, it's just um, just one of those things, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so I'm just going to check with the backstage team. Uh, as I understand it, we've got, uh, even though the agenda is, is, is slightly changed, we may still have merit from Geothermal. I'm just checking with the backstage team if we have that. If not, then we'll go over to the Q&A. Um, and we don't have Marit, unfortunately. Uh, so um, Marit's presentation is a very, very good presentation. So what I will do is I'll work with Alessandra and with Marit and our events team, uh, our industry solutions team, 
and we'll try and get a recording that we can post onto onto the pub website. So apologies again for that. Supposedly they say never work with technology. We are a software company, so I'm not going to say that, of course. So let's um, let's dive into uh, the Q and A. Uh, we've got all of our presenters on. Uh, Jenna, Sean, uh, Anne, thank you. Uh, Keith may have fallen off as well, unfortunately. No. Okay. Well, the first question uh, I'd like to go to Anne. Uh, I did miss your presentation, Anne. Uh, however, uh, I have seen it uh, with you, so I did have a particular question on it, if you don't mind. Um, the first one uh, is around the, the length of time that, that Orsted have taken to completely pivot the business, right? And from memory, it's about 11 years or so up to today. Now, over the past few years, there's been an increased amount of investment, an increased amount of preferable legislation, um, there's more knowledge around that. So if Orsted was starting the pivot or the transition today, how much of that 11 years do you feel would be cut out with all of the recent positive stuff that's happened around wind? To be honest, I don't think we could have done it in, in, in any different way. Uh, we actually decommissioned our first wind farm a couple of years ago, so we've been the first offshore wind farm we built was almost 25 years ago. Um, and I think where we are today is really built on the learnings that we've had. Uh, I have several colleagues that have been here in the, in the company for many years, and they say, if we knew what we knew today, there was some, some of the wind farms that we have built that we wouldn't have built today. Um, so I, I really think also from, from our knowledge about data, we have really learned uh, during this journey. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm just sifting through the questions. Uh, Sean, uh, maybe one for you, uh, if you don't mind, before I hand over uh, to Alessandra, who's going through the other questions. Sean, could you share your thoughts on the importance of maintaining an authoritative spatial database to aid in the use of suitability assessments and environmental impacts? Or maybe just spinning it around the other one, if you didn't have an authoritative spatial database, how much more effort would be required by different parts of the business? Sure, yeah, I'll first maybe speak on the port assessment side of things. Uh, I'll say first that one of the major benefits to uh, maintaining an authoritative spatial database is uh, really the ability to reproduce tasks or workflows. Um, I, I realized pretty early on in my time doing these types of projects that I found, I found myself tracking down a lot of the same uh, information uh, for the same ports kind of over and over again. Um, and that was really because while we were using GIS to develop uh, these kind of sets of attributes, um, they were often stored in, in other databases kind of spread across the company really. Um, and so, yeah, so having a, having a central place to, to give everything was really, uh, you know, hugely important for, for efficiency sake. Um, and, and really as an added benefit, it, um, you know, you know, the more projects you work on, the more comprehensive it becomes, and the more useful uh, that that central spa uh, spatial database spatial database becomes. Thank you, Sean, Alessandra. I think you've been combing through some of the Q and A as well. Yeah, I'm not sure if Jenna can hear us. I see your video. Um, Jenna, can you give it a, a test word or two? Hi, I can hear you. Okay, we may not be able to see you, but <laughs> oh, we can hear uh -oh. you. <laughs> so, um, Jenna, we have this question. We often see, you know, pretty negative headlines between the public and energy companies. So have you noticed that, you know, the implementation of your system um, for the public, you know, to create more knowledge greatly available, has this bridged any gaps between the often contentious engagements of renewable energy development? Yeah, so I think, you know, most importantly, we as the Northeast Ocean Data Portal team 
strive to make authoritative data available to everyone. Um, we also, you know, go to great lengths to, you know, make it known that we have new data sources available or we've updated a certain data source so that everyone's on the same page. Um, and so hopefully we can bridge those gaps. Um, I think additionally, you know, we, we take feedback from users as, as readily as they will provide it and try to address any questions, um, you know, by updating our documentation or information about a layer just so that it's clear and, um, you know, vetted by the public and vetted by our users and um, just try to keep everyone on the same page so that if there are gaps, uh, you know, ask us about them and <laughs> we'll try to address them and, and just just simply by providing the data in a way that's um, usable and, and understandable to everyone. I was on mute. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, Lisa, can you hear us? And it may not be able to hear her audio. How about Malcolm? I'm here. Okay, great, Malcolm. <laughs> So I had this question come through our q and I thought this was great. So um, first of all, poke horns, I'm a longhorn myself. Um, but can you talk about how you got linked up with geothermal and how quickly were you able to bring GIS into those workflows? Sure, um, I came to geothermal uh, actually through my innovation job when I was at Shell. Um, and the innovation part of Shell was actually split into two, the oil and gas innovation side and the, and the renewable energy, uh, uh, new energy space. And um, it was clear to me from day one that the new energy space was expanding and the oil and gas side was contracting. And I came in to the oil and gas side. So I wanted to figure out how I could jump from the oil and gas to the renewable energies and bring my tool set with me. Ge geological and, and GIS. And so I decided um, to try to figure out what that would be. And it turns out to be geothermal. And I did it by interviewing people inside Shell and outside of Shell, asking them, what are the top 10 problems? And you saw in my presentation, that top 10 list, that was the list that I chose to attack using innovation. How can I solve those problems so that geothermal can expand. And that's how I came to Ever because I felt Ever met a lot of those problems. Um, the GIS aspect of it to me is, is, is just part of my day-to-day -day work. I was using GIS from day one um, because the, uh, one of the big problems with traditional geothermal is it's limited in extent, geographic extent, to the sort of the ring of fire, about 10% of the earth, Iceland, Hawaii, you know, et cetera. And so uh, I was trying to figure out how to expand that and what characteristics do I need to look for to expand that footprint to geothermal anywhere. Um, and so uh, GIS has been, been a part of it from day one. And surprisingly, the amount of it was already in the, in the Shell oil and gas database. Uh, you know, sedimentary thicknesses, rock types, you know, a lot of oil uh, uh, well penetrations, et cetera. Great, fantastic. Thank you for that. We have. Um, a large amount, you know, as Billy and I run renewables for Esri, a large amount of questions from oil and gas companies wanting to know how they can harmonize their portfolio. And then, of course, you know, this is an area for all of us to personally grow. So we get a lot of questions on personal development, too. So thank you so much for sharing your story today. We really appreciate it. And let's see, Billy, did we have any other questions or the other speakers be able to join us here? Uh, I um, I wanted, uh, I, there was a question for that I thought was useful for Marit and for Malcolm. Marit, I don't think is on, unfortunately she hasn't had her time in the sunshine today. Um, but I might just ask it so we can get uh, Malcolm's view, if that's all right, Malcolm. Yes. Uh, and apologies, I'm just going to read off just so I don't miss, uh, miss the important parts. Uh, so Marit, uh, sorry, Malcolm, we've seen clear analogies to oil and gas, and we've clearly known about circulating hot fluids for a long time. So what is the difference now? And I, and I think you've just touched upon this previously. What were the barriers of entry to geothermal previously? Sure. I'll take the second half of that question first, because um, yeah. I really talked about the technical barriers already. You know, that top 10 list of challenges. Those were all technical challenges, more or less. 
Um, but I, I ran into a couple of challenges in the um, geothermal world uh, at Shell that I thought are informative. Um, one is that a uh, because we were trying to do geothermal projects in the new energies part of the business, um, they were trying to compare a geothermal project to a solar project or a wind project in terms of the economic value to the company. And it's comparing apples and oranges. You know, the, the, an oil, a geothermal project looks like an oil and gas project. There's a long lead in, there's a big capex, the payback is 10 years or more. Uh, and with on the oil and gas side, wow, those are good projects. But in a compared to a wind and solar project, the people who are app evaluating them couldn't give geothermal a fair shake. So one of the things that we've learned is try to figure out how to fit into the decision making process um, at, at your company was 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 a, a substantial challenge. And getting people to listen to uh, an idea when their background is all surface and you know uh, wind or, or, or PV um, was was a substantial challenge. Um, one of the uh, you know you know what are the what were the barriers? So I would say that was a barrier. Uh, what has changed? I think the the landscape in in geothermal has changed in two years or even less, maybe one year. Uh, and part of it is this closed loop thing and um, new drilling technology. Um, I think that is, like I said, the top number one on my list was drilling technology. And there have been enormous changes in the drilling technology space that I think is part of the, the key to breaking geothermal loose. That's what's different. The, the other is the recognition of the fact that um, electricity isn't the only product. Um, when you're competing on electricity, you're competing with wind and solar, which can be negative at times. Um, and so um, uh, if you can get to producing heat directly, you don't pay a conversion penalty. You go direct to the to the customer and um, it's much more efficient use of that um, uh, of that resource of that energy. So to me, the things that, that are breaking it loose are the lowered cost of drilling and the application to new markets. Perfect. As detailed as always, thank you very much, Malcolm. Uh, Alessandra, I think we have Keith back. Uh, do we have any for Keith? Yeah, we do. Um, and thanks, Keith, again for joining. So you may not be able to discuss specifics here, but can you kind of speak to the financial return on investment that your real-time workflows and tools provide to Enel? Maybe like impact on safety of employees um, out in the field? Sure. I, I can give you a bit of a, an overview of how uh, you know, this provides value to the organization. I can't speak to specific figures uh, for obvious reasons, but um, essentially the reason why we started creating this dashboard, well, first off, I started doing it because I wanted a really good use case for GeoEvent server. And then an actual business case happened to come up right after that. And it's that our project investors now are asking us to do inspections within 72 hours of a lightning strike. So we, we now have this contractual obligation to capture this information and act on it. And, you know, the project investors are looking out for their own end as well to minimize risk. Uh, so in, in, in the same context, this applies to us as well as we are partial owners and, and operators of the, of the plant. And so, you know, the way this helps reduce risk is alluded to in the presentation is by the early detection of damages. Um, you know, having lead time to schedule repairs can reduce the cost dramatically. Uh, usually 20% or more, um, and being able to then also reduce the scope of those repairs further reduces the cost, and they can have a better understanding of how to fit that in with the limited amount of uh, dollars that they have to do repairs on, a, on an annual basis. Uh, the second big part of this is warranty claims. Uh, we now have better information to be able to defend any uh, warranty claims we mean or may need to make against the blade manufacturers for uh, you know, faulty lightning attenuation systems and things like that. We now have the ability to demonstrate how many times a turbine's been struck by lightning. Um, as often that's been the case in the past where, you know, they'll allude to that, you know, it was external damages and not an actual defect. So this gives us better information uh, to prepare uh, to defend in a warranty claim, as well as to optimize our, our repair schedules. As far as the health and safety aspects of it, um, we're not using this system currently for that pur purpose. We're using a dedicated system uh, through DTN, uh, but we're currently in the process of replicating that functionality 
using this same um, alerting system here to be able to provide those uh, uh, life safety alerts so our, our personnel, you know, vacate uh, the turbines and seek shelter when lightning storms are approaching. It's the same concept, but you have to also track when the events start and end. Um, and so we've just uh, finished development of those processes and they need to be implemented. So it's a it's functionality coming in the future, which will tie all this together. Perfect. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, just looking at the clock, we're getting pretty close to uh, the end of our session today. So um, I'll jump in here and maybe close off the renewables track for this year's pug. We hope you found it insightful. Um, and apologies again for some of the technical difficulties that we saw with the presenters and, and with myself as well. Um, we will, after this, uh, ensure that anything that was missed does get posted onto the website, certainly Marit's presentation on geothermal, which is fantastic. We will make sure that that is done. So in closing, I would like to leave you with a number of different thoughts. Uh, the first one uh, is around the pug being so such a useful forum. One of the reasons PUG has developed such a following over the 30 years that it's been around is how the sharing and the collaborativeness of the, of the users and the members has surfaced to the top uh, at every single conference and in between. We certainly feel, Alessandro, myself and the natural resources team, we certainly feel that there is a similar opportunity to build a community for the renewable energy field specifically. One that does have an identity of its own, rightly so, but also one that is collaborative with other related communities. Oil and gas is an obvious one, oceans, environment, utilities, uh, engineering and construction, as we heard from, from, from Sean earlier on as well. So I'd like you to encourage, or I'd like to encourage you to do two things. First of all is reach out to others within the renewable energy sector. I know it's a little bit harder at the moment, we're in a virtual world, However, every single presentation today had the contact details of the presenter at the very end. Now, providing, uh, putting commercial sensitivities aside, I am pretty sure that everybody in the audience, all of the presenters are more than happy to share, be collaborative, talk about the challenges and how they overcame those challenges. And ultimately what that does is that it helps all of us get to where we want to a little bit quicker. The other thing I'd like you to do is reach out internally to all of these new different business units. We here all know the value that GIS can bring, but understandably they might not. So let's get them to come along on this journey with us to a more sustainable world. Finally, and I do realize we're getting close to lunch or dinner, depending on where you are in the world, uh, there's a number of, of groups that I would like to thank, and these are in no particular order. First of all, it's uh, the, the unsung heroes from an Esri perspective. We have a huge team backstage and we've seen them beavering away whilst we've had some of the technical issues today. Um, but aside from that, the amount of effort that they, our marketing teams, our industry solutions team with Jeff and Brian, uh, and our solution engineers help us to, to pull all of this material together with the 486 different moving cogs. It is, it is a huge undertaking internally. Secondly, I'd like to thank all of the presenters. Uh, having worked with you and spoken to you over the last few weeks, uh, either via Alessandro or myself, we appreciate how much effort you have put into, uh, into putting your recordings or your presentations together and also being available after this for people to reach out to as well. So thank you very much. And finally, and, and by no means least, of course, it's to everybody who's joined uh, today to listen in. We hope uh, that you found it beneficial, insightful, uh, inspiring in certain cases. And the natural resources team, Alessandra and myself, look forward to supporting you in all of your efforts going forward. So thank you very much. <laughs>